Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium, and also please uh, remember to fill out the uh, program evaluations and turn those in. And if you have any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers, the CME committee is always quite appreciative of those. Um, Today, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing Dr. Linda Lehman. Uh, Dr. Lehman is a graduate of the University of Iowa Medical School, did her internship uh, at Gunderson Clinic, and then uh, did her residency in ophthalmology at the Mayo Clinic. She's been a member of the Departments of Ophthalmology uh, at McFarland and Mary Greeley Medical Center since 1997, and she has graciously accepted the CME Committee's uh, invitation to update us on uh, consults in ophthalmology. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Lehman. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the CME committee for this wonderful topic because it's near and dear to my heart. So I'm delighted to talk to you about when to consult ophthalmology. In order to give you sort of an idea of the consults that we get, I, just, I selected two from the last six months. And I'm going to start with those. So here's my first consult. It's an eye. Scary. Here's my second consult. A 17-year-old who's lost vision in her left eye last night. Her visual acuity is 20-20 in the right eye and 2200 in the left eye. Her pressure is 15 in the right eye, 16 in the left eye. The eye's not injected. I think the optic nerve is swollen. Now that's a consult. Which of these consults is appropriate? Actually, they both are. They're both very appropriate. In a survey, an online survey from JAMA, um, respondents described the loss of eyesight as worse than losing memory, speech, hearing, or a limb. Your patients are very concerned about their eyesight, and you should be too. We all have different amounts of training and different levels of comfort. So I would like you to be comfortable with your eye exam and when to consult ophthalmology when you're uncomfortable. So if you've gone beyond the level of your training or you want to know what is the next step, that's the take home point. Call us, we're nice people. Ophthalmology and Ames are very nice people. So as I was trying to think about how I could best organize this uh, talk to help you, I thought, you know, it always gets your attention if we talk about things that can blind your patient or things that can kill your patient or unfortunately in 2016, things you can be sued over. But a lot of these topics um, cross all of those lines, or at least a couple of them. So this is how I've decided we're going to talk. We're gonna talk about diabetes, the red eye, retinal detachments, trauma, glaucoma, macular de degeneration, amblyopia, and then I threw in a few things at the end not to miss. There are several sources that you can use for guidelines to diabetes, but since I'm an ophthalmologist and since we have just done our preferred practice pattern, updated it for 2016, the next seven slides are going to be the take home points from this. So I think these are very appropriate and what I would strongly encourage. One of the things I was asked to talk about is why do I need to tell my patients they need to go for an annual diabetic eye exam? The prevalence of diabetes is increasing, diabetic retinopathy is increasing, and unfortunately, vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy is also expected to increase dramatically. How well are we doing? Well, currently, only about 60% of our diabetic patients are having their yearly screening for diabetic retinopathy. So I think we can do better. When do you send somebody? Type 1? three to five years, the, the ophthalmology recommendation is five years after their onset, type two right away. And that's because type two diabetics may have had hyperglycemia for a long time. We're going to tell your patients the same things that you're gonna tell them. Try to keep your glucose as even and as well controlled as possible. And those are very related, but not necessarily the same thing. So it's very difficult, it's hard on the retina to go from a blood sugar of 40 to 400. It's probably better to be you know, around 200, so even and well-controlled as possible. But we would like them to be, have their blood glucose levels, their serum lipids, and their blood pressure under good control. 
This is also a point that sometimes people wonder. For diabetes, you're not going to make their diabetic retinopathy worse if patients are on aspirin. Another issue is pregnancy. So if a patient develops gestational diabetes, they really don't have a significant increase of any eye problems. But if the patient is a diabetic, we would like to see them right away within their first trimester. And depending on the findings, then we would determine how often we need to see them. So when do you get an ophthalmology consult? It's required when there's non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, or macular edema. Another thing I was asked to talk about was to sort of explain the vernacular. What about this language? I can't sometimes read these ophthalmology notes. So this is a good place to start. Non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy is shown here. So one of the first changing, changes in diabetes is the hyperglycemia. There we go causes some outpouching of the retinal vessels, and you can get little microaneurysms. And sometimes they can burst in the retina, and you can get these dot and blot hemorrhages. So this is an example of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. In addition to that, you can sometimes get deposits of cholesterol or fats that leak into the retina, and this is non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. This is a fluorescein angiogram, and it shows that non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, these white dots. Proliferative would be the next step up. So we're going to need to do something. Neovascularization is present. Vascular endothelial growth factor is released that can cause problems. And here you can see an optic nerve. And unfortunately, all of this is neovascularization. Now, neovascularization sounds like a good idea, right? We need new blood vessels. Unfortunately, diabetic new blood vessels are not the same quality as the original, and they, in fact, can grow in the wrong place. They can grow into the vitreous. And one of my saddest days in training was when I saw a 16-year-old who had funnel retinal detachments, nothing we could do because she had never had any treatment for her diabetic retinopathy. So neovascularization can occur anywhere in the retina, this is an example of neovascularization elsewhere. And so we need to be able to find this. And if we don't see your patients, we won't be able to find this and treat them. So we don't want to get to this stage. Here's the optic nerve under here. This is all the neovascularization. And you can see a little ischemia of the retina here as well. What do we do? Well, there are various treatments. Again. In understanding some of our abbreviations, PRP is panretinal photocoagulation, and this is laser to the peripheral retina. And you might think that these laser burns, which decrease the vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, would cause a lot of problems. But actually, they cause very few problems, and they reduce severe vision loss by 50%. The third reason was macular edema. So here's the macula, and we see these exudates. This reminds me, I don't know if any of you ever had an awesome clinician, but when I was at Mayo Clinic, John Henderson was there. He trained long before CTs and MRIs, and yet he could practically shake the patient's hand and tell you what was wrong. Now, of course, we just get our MRIs, right? The, equivalent, I think, of MRI for ophthalmologists is called an OCT. So this, is, this would be the vitreous. Here's our normal retina. And we have this nice foveal depression. So that's what we like to see. Unfortunately, with macular edema, we see, see often cystic changes. So instead of that nice depression, we've got macular edema. Anti-VEGF has kind of revolutionized ophthalmology. It was originally used for macular degeneration, and now it's used for diabetic retinopathy and many other things. This is a partial list of anti-VEGF agents. It still amazes me that somebody realized that a colon cancer drug that decreased neovascularization might be beneficial in wet macular degeneration. And had the, um, the fortitude, I guess, to go ahead and inject it in an eye. Um, 
after that, then we developed the one that was specifically for the eyes, you know, because there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Unfortunately, in doing that, uh, the price increased somewhere around six to eight fold. And some of the other agents here as well. Oh, I forgot to warn you, sorry. This is, a, this is my picture of um, an anti-VEGF injection. So when people say shots in the eye, this is that. On to red eye. This is a picture from the American Academy of Ophthalmology of a viral conjunctivitis. So sometimes viral conjunctivitis can look pretty bad, but they have clear tears here. And so if you would like, you can uh, leave for the fire alarm, but otherwise I'm gonna continue. Um, you can use uh, cool compresses to treat viral conjunctivitis. Um, and also don't forget preservative-free tears and don't discount these. These can really help patients a lot. So if you feel it's viral, say, great, we don't have to give you an expensive antibiotic. You can use these cool compresses and use these tears. I've talked before in Grand Rounds about which back antibiotic I use for bacterial and you know that varies. We can discuss that more. But the topic today is when to refer. And if they're not improving in three to five days or back to normal in five to seven, you should consider a referral. So this is a summary slide of a number of reasons that I feel that you should refer your patients when they have a red eye. Loss of vision. Vision is our vital sign. I love that consult where they gave me the vision. Vision is our vital sign. Loss of vision, send them over. Eye surgery. You know, sometimes I've been told, uh, this patient had cataract surgery in 2008. That probably doesn't make a bit of difference for their red eye. But if they've had surgery within the last month, send them immediately to their surgeon. That's very important. If they have a systemic disease, if they have had a history of iritis or uveitis, or they have a disease that can be associated with that, please send them for a slit lamp exam so we can see whether it is iritis or a conjunctivitis. Herpetic disease, unfortunately, can cause loss of vision, and we'll talk a little bit more about those. Trauma. And then I agree with the American Family Practice uh, statement, which said if steroids are needed, they should see an eye doctor my personal bias. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about the differential diagnosis of red eye. And one thing that people tend to discount, not pay a lot of attention to, and is ubiquitous, is dry eye. Now sometimes dry eye can be aggravated by blepharitis, inflammation at the base of the eyelashes, or mybomitis, which is plugging of the meibomian glands. Remember, the tears are composed of oil, water, and mucin. And all of these things, if they're off, we can have a different composition and quantity of tears. We talked a little bit about bacterial and viral conjunctivitis. You're all pretty familiar with allergic as well. We'll talk a little more about herpetic disease and a little more about the family of iritis, uveitis, episcleritis. Oops, we went too far. So what do you recognize for dry eye symptoms? One of the ones that's confusing can be watery eyes. Patients say, well, how can I have dry eyes? My eyes are tearing. And I explain to patients that sometimes the eyes dry out, that kicks in the reflux production of tears, and that can overwhelm the system. But if they say burning, uh, red, itchy, scratchy, gritty, foreign body sensation, they can actually have strings of mucus if, from dry eyes. Their symptoms might be worse with reading or computer or TV or cigarette smoke or wind. If they're contact lens intolerant, more, more likely than not, they have dry eyes. And also, a car or an airplane can be a closed area. And in fact, when I have patients who take those overseas flights, I often tell them, get your preservative-free tears and put a drop in every hour while you're awake. It will make you much more comfortable and less likely to get an infection because I think dry eyes is an underlying reason that people sometimes then are susceptible. We sometimes cause those dry eyes. They can be iatrogenic. Go get your antihistamine or we prescribe antidepressants. What do we do to treat them? If you can stop or change those medications, great. Lubricant eye drops are a standard treatment and you know we could talk all about those. So if you have questions, I think those would be better afterwards. Drink water. And there are some supplements that have been effective. So 
these, I've put them in your handout. Some of my patients that really are not liking tears at all do well with dietary supplements. I'm always a little concerned about the fat-soluble ones, D, E, A, and K, so that's why I said no more than. We can do some things for dry eyes as well. So the puncta are the little holes in each of the eyelids where the tears drain. If we put a plug in, that keeps your own tears in the eye longer. And thermal cautery is the same idea. There are a couple of prescription medications. And don't forget that blepharitis, mybomitis. So eyelid hygiene can be very uh, effective. So cyclosporin has been around for a long time. The liftograst uh, was just approved at the end of September. So I do have some patients that are on that, but I think the jury is still out. Herpes simplex is the primary infection is a systemic disease. You should refer them if they have any vision concerns at all, if their eyes red, if they're light sensitive. This is the classic dendrite that you see. Now, you won't see it as pink because this is rose bangle staining. We, we see this on the slit lamp, but that's a classic herpes simplex. This is more likely what you're gonna see externally. And then at a slit lamp, we're going to see something, and it can look of a variety of different shapes. Those of you who like to use fluorescein, you can always put a little fluoresce strip in the tears and take a look. We would prefer to see them before they get to this stage because this um, patient has lost vision and they require much more significant interventions. On to zoster, most of you know Hutchinson sign. One of these grand rounds a while ago, I had that as a question. We had the interactive, and I think like 80% of you got it right. Of course, part of that is our ophthalmology role. So um, treatment, again, antiviral. When patients come over and they already have their antiviral of choice, um, I tell them, this is your number one treatment for your eye disease. You should refer people if they have red eye, light sensitivity, decreased vision, or if the lesions involve the eyelid margin or the tip of the nose. So here's a significant case of herpes zoster. This one kind of comes in labeled with its uh, midline involvement, but sometimes they just have a few lesions. If those lesions are located below the eyebrow or on the eyelid, we should definitely see them. This is what we're likely to see on a slit lamp. These are called pseudodendrites. We can also see stromal involvement a little deeper in the cornea, and you could see how this could be vision threatening. Sometimes they're even worse. So we'd like to see those patients early. One of the review articles I looked at before this grand rounds was on uveitis, and there were 30-some different uveitides, um, some of which I actually haven't seen in practice. So I just remind you of the common things. If the patient has a systemic disease, if they're HLA-B27 positive, ankylosing spondylitis, think inflammatory bowel disease, reactive or psoriatic arthritis, if they're post-op, and I mean like within a month, if they're post-traumatic, you can develop a post-traumatic iritis, and your antibiotic is not going to do a thing for that. Just to remind you, the most common one I think I see is probably ankylosing spondylitis. So if they have that, send them on over for an eye exam. What are we going to do for them? One thing that I think is really cool in ophthalmology is our drops are color-coded. So a red top drop is a dilating drop. Sometimes patients don't know what they're on. But if you ask them the cap color, yeah, yellow is a beta blocker. We'll know what you're on. Unfortunately, not all the generics are perfect. But in general, you can tell what the patient is on based on the cap color. So this is what I am going to do. I'm going to give them a good slit lamp exam, make sure we have the diagnosis, make sure we do an interocular pressure. And then the cycloplegia can help a lot because some people have the pain from ciliary muscle spasm. So we don't want the iris to scar down to the lens. And then uh, helping that muscle to relax also makes the patients a lot more comfortable. 
During the day, we generally tend to use uh, topical steroid. My preference is prednisolone acetate. Some of the pharmacies are substituting prednisolone phosphate. And if it's working, great. But if not, we may need to go back to that. And sometimes we even need to go back to the brand name. I like to, if it's severe, treat them overnight. So I am going to use uh, some steroid ointments often. Periocular steroids, this is another eye injection, although it's the surface of the eye as opposed to in, uh, internally. It's just under the conjunctiva or tenons. And that can be very, very effective for anterior uveitis, generally much more effective than systemic steroids. In the article I quoted earlier, they said that 10% may need your immunosuppression. I don't think it's quite that high. But again, in addition to ophthalmologists being nice folks, uh, your rheumatologist is a nice person as well. The next topic is superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. So this is, the patient might come in with pain and their eye looks pretty good, but then if you lift up the eyelid and have them look down, you may see this. So just a reminder, the limbus is the area right here. Sort of, you can think where the colored part and the white part meet. And this is the upper lid lifted up. This is associated with thyroid disease, so I generally would get a free T4 and a TSH. Since we're on the topic of thyroid, if you see somebody that looks like this, they should be having an eye exam because they are very likely to have at least anterior involvement. What we want to get them is before they have posterior involvement. So here's the CT, and this is your optic nerve. And these are the rectus muscles, medial, inferior, superior, lateral. Generally, these two are the most involved in thyroid disease. We've got a bony orbit, and the optic nerve wants to go through there. And if the space is taken up by those enlarged muscles, you can have vision loss as shown in this visual field. So I think that every patient with thyroid disease should be seen for an annual eye exam. At least we can tell them about the anterior stuff if not uh, needing to worry about the posterior. Retinal detachment. I want you all to be very familiar with the signs of retinal detachment, flashing lights. When somebody calls at our office and they say they're having flashing lights, our receptionists are instructed, get them in. You know, we want to see them that day. Floaters and a curtain or cobweb. Now floaters, Everybody has floaters, right? One, two, half a dozen against a white background, the computer screen, the blue sky. That's normal. But uh, too many floaters to count is not, or one huge floater that's interfering with your vision. That one huge floater that's interfering with your vision is often a posterior vitreous detachment. So the vitreous, you remember, is the jelly-like substance that fills the back of the eye. And in all of us, it's sort of loosely attached around the optic nerve. And as the vitreous changes with birthdays, uh, it can pull away from the optic nerve and the retina. And that traction on the retina can cause the light flashes. The floaters can actually be if a, a vessel breaks and you can be seeing your red blood cells. Here's a picture of a posterior vitreous detachment that you might be able to see with your direct ophthalmoscope. So you look in, here's the optic nerve. This particular posterior vitreous detachment, which is right here, so it's something floating in the eye above the optic nerve, has caused a little hemorrhage. So these patients should be referred because some of them will have a retinal detachment, as one we had this week. So you can see, I hope, this horseshoe tear. And this can happen when a patient has a posterior vitreous detachment. So what do we do? Well, if they show up in the office, we can laser. You saw those laser spots. We try to go around that to, to secure that so that the fluid can't get behind the retina and cause uh, retinal detachment, a significant one. Unfortunately, this is a significant retinal detachment. So the retina is kind of floating there in the middle of the eye. And with this, we would need a more extensive repair. Trauma. When do you refer? Vision is our vital sign. Decreased vision, we want to see them. A painful eye, flashing lights, I just told you, that can be damage to the retina. If you think the eye looks abnormal, send them on over. We'll take a look with our $20,000 slit lamp. That will help. And of course, significant trauma. You know, I, I, I did one time have a patient that said, ah, 
there was somebody in the room with a laser pointer, so I might have trauma to my eye. Probably you don't need to send that one. Or at least not to the ophthalmologist, huh? So significant trauma. Um, unfortunately, there are cases like this. Here's the eyeball. This one, we're going to take to the OR to see whether that's an open globe or not, whether that the eye, we were lucky and it stopped here, or, or whether the eye is involved. Some of them are not, not that obvious. In fact, in my first six months here, um, my nurse came out of the room and she said, this person who was sent for trauma, for hammering, it's nothing. The eye's white and quiet. Their vision's 20-20. It looks great. But then I picked up the eyelid and I saw something like this. So this is the uvea. This is an open globe. And that definitely needs evaluation and surgical repair. So depending on the level of trauma. Now glaucoma, we have um, very good glaucoma doctors. And Dr. Hamusha has given us some nice uh, talks. I've got one of them checked out here. Uh, also, we're not talking about ocular effects of systemic disease because Dr. Scallon did that earlier this year. But glaucoma, the one that nobody wants to miss, is angle closure glaucoma. So I have a slit lamp picture to show you this. The patient's eye is red and it's painful and their vision is often affected. And if you look here, the iris is bowing forward and this is the cornea. The iris and the cornea are touching. This picture was taken after a laser procedure to make a little hole in the iris, peripheral iridectomy. And then we have the space now between the cornea and the iris. So if there's a concern, and if you're one of those amazing people, I'm still amazed that our ER sent, tells me what the pressure is. You know, and the pressure is 40, why he should be calling us. Normal range is 10 to 21. Macular degeneration also we're just going to touch on, but here's a picture. So here's the optic nerve, and this is all abnormal. That's age-related in general. Patients often ask, well, do I have dry or wet, and which is the worst? Unfortunately, you can be legally blind from both, but wet is the one that people tend to think of as worse because dry tends to be more slow, and wet you can sort of lose vision overnight. What do we do for treatment of this? Some people say there is no treatment for dry macular degeneration, but there definitely is. Um, a healthy diet. I tell patients your colorful plate of foods. AREDS stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study. And then we have the Age-Related Eye Disease Study 2 vitamins. And these are now, since this has been out long enough, there's generics. You can go to any pharmacy and find Age-Related Eye Disease 2 vitamins. But one of the take-home points here, I think, is is the association with smoking. Make sure your patients know there is a, an association, a strong association with smoking and macular degeneration. And in fact, one of my patients, I do have a successful patient who stopped smoking when we diagnosed her macular degeneration, and she tried previously. Um, family members smoked, and parents had lost vision from macular degeneration. So maybe that's the final push you need to get somebody to stop smoking. There is an official thing called an Amsler grid, and check one eye at a time, and make sure that that looks nice and straight. The lines are supposed to be straight. I have patients that use their bathroom tile, or maybe the phone posts. But in any event, we would ideally like patients with macular degeneration to be checking their Amsler grid weekly. And of course, they should all have an annual uh, eye exam. The treatment of wet is the same as dry. All of those things are important, but this is again when you get the, quote, shot in your eye, or sometimes laser. Here's a picture of that. So again, the wonderful uh, OCT that we now have, which to me is kind of like the equivalent of the MRI for the brain, the OCT for the eye. So here's the macula, and you can see the submacular fluid. Then after injection of an anti-VEGF factor, you can see that that has, this is just one injection, that has already caused significant decrease in the macular edema. So when do you refer your macular degeneration patients? Again, they should all have an annual exam. But obviously, if there's any change in vision, our vital sign, or a change on the AMSA grid, we would like to see them. 
Now, this topic is near and dear to my heart because I, I really like to see children. And amblyopia is when the brain doesn't completely develop due to various reasons. Today, we had one child who has ptosis. We had one child who had exotropia, this just this morning, and one child who has esotropia. So esotropia, the eyes crossed in, exotropia out. That tends to be more intermittent and not as significant for amblyopia. But anybody who has abnormal um, vision, anybody who fails a vision screening or doesn't have their eyes aligned, or even family history, I think they all deserve a formal ophthalmology consultation. But I also want to point out that these children grow up and become adults. And some of them were not caught. And so adults who have useful vision and one eye only should definitely have annual eye exams and wear protective glasses. Sometimes some of your friends or relatives will have babies and the babies look a little funny when they're first born. Maybe their eyes aren't perfectly aligned. That actually can be normal up to four months of age. Eyes that are continuously crossed, though, in a baby, that's not normal. So if the kid looks like this, get them in. And if it's longer than four months. So now I want to give you a case, also uh, very recent, of a patient of mine who has amblyopia. She's a busy researcher, and she comes in because she knows she has to come in for annual exam. But it's like, let's just get this over. I'm having no problems, right? I'm having no problems. So I look at her, and her amblyopic 2200 eye, the optic nerve looks pale. So I said, well, you know, we really need a scan. I'm having no symptoms. Well, unfortunately, she was one of those people who failed the MRI. So we talked, and I said, well, why don't you come in and we'll do a visual field? That's kind of a poor man's MRI. And it showed nothing in her good eye, but it was a definite vertical defect, a temporal defect in the other eye. And looking in the literature, there, there certainly are a lot of cases reported, and the majority of those were uh, pituitary adenoma. So now I know where I'm looking. We got a CT, and unfortunately, it looks something like this. And that patient is having neurosurgery this week. On to think of things not to miss. Brain tumors, headaches. I gave you this slide, actually, last time I gave grand rounds. 47% uh, of us have headaches, so it's probably not a brain tumor. If you have these other things, it's probably not the ophthalmologist you should be seeing. And we have friendly ophthalmologists, rheumatologists, and radiologists. So. If they have those symptoms and you're not sure which scan to order, I found the radiologist to be very helpful. Another thing not to miss. So, you know, once in a while a patient will be in for a routine exam and they'll say, well, this funny thing happened to me. It was just not very long, but in one eye only, I couldn't see half of my vision. And it's the horizontal midline. It's either the upper half or the lower half. For this, you really need to investigate what's happening. And I generally will do a carotid ultrasound first. I think that's the highest yield. If that's normal or not significant, then I generally do a cardiac echo. So we're just breezing through these things. Cranial nerve palsies, just to remind you, cranial nerve 6 innervates the lateral rectus. So it's the one that lets the, the eye go out. So this particular person has a um, cranial nerve palsy 6. This is perhaps even scarier, the cranial nerve 3. If your patient comes in and they have one eye closed and the eye, when you lift up the eyelid, is down and out, that is an aneurysm until proven otherwise. And the good news is we can get a CTA. So don't miss those. And cranial nerve 6 and 3 can also be temporal arteritis. So ask your patients, does it hurt when you chew? Does it hurt when you comb your hair? If they have these symptoms, C-reactive protein and SED rate is what you want to get. Now, our lab will say anything over 29 and the SED rate is elevated. Generally, when I've actually had positive temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis, the SED rate can be 100. The C-reactive protein can be 5. So just a reminder, if your patient's 80 years old, you know, up to, and, and it's 33, I'm not going to be 
overly concerned. Now, you don't want to miss things, so certainly you can run it by us or run it by your friendly rheumatologist. What do you do if you, th if you have a strong suspicion? Go ahead and treat. Don't wait for the temporal artery biopsy because this is potentially blinding. And again, you can call your friendly ophthalmologist or rheumatologist for help. Something else not to miss. You look into the eye and you see this feathery edge. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious. If you don't know for sure, send them on over. Because you know, sometimes if it's subtle, we have, we can use that same OCT, my MRI of the eye, to image the optic nerve. And we can also follow patients. So for example, women with pseudotumor, generally it's women, um, we can actually see how the treatment is progressing, not just with the visual field, but with our OCT. So if it looks a little funny, send them over. So I was asked to talk about when to consult an ophthalmologist. And my son has a theory that you can find the answer to everything on Google. So I decided, what the heck, let's Google it. When to consult ophthalmology. As it turns out, there was a well-quoted study by Kristen Carter out of San Francisco, and she listed in their inpatient service 92 different reasons that ophthalmology was consults were requested. And the top five are listed there. Refractive error. Oh, I was going to show you my exciting new glasses. I just got these today. So if it's a need for glasses, we'll be happy to see them. Um, but that's not going to be an uh, emergent consult like some of these others. Um, fungal ophthalmitis, I think that had more to do with where this study was done. But we would very much expect, you know, if you're not sure about the conjunctivitis, certainly every diabetic, you know, if you've got a corneal abrasion, if you're not comfortable, that's the take-home point. If you're not comfortable, send them to us. We will be happy to see them. My Google search also uh, led to a level one trauma center, and again, for that, then not surprising that orbital fracture was their number one reason for consultation. But ocular manifestations of systemic disease. So think, you know, send all your diabetics and patients with uveities. And this one I liked a lot. So when to consult ophthalmology. This is a PGI-1 patient, and he was going into ophthalmology. So that's the first year after medical school. And his resident told him, get an ophthalmology consult. And he's going into eye, so he wants to do a good job. So he goes up to the bedside, and there's no way of checking vision. But maybe there is. He picked up the newspaper. So he got newspaper print. He got the whole history. And then at 2 p.m., he called the ophthalmologist, the ophthalmology resident for a consult. And she told him he did not do it properly and that ophthalmology consults were to be done before noon. So went to consult an ophthalmologist in the morning. <laughs> so if you're still looking for a holiday present for any of your colleagues, I kind of like this. So thank you very much, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Apparently, it was crystal clear. That's awesome. <laughs> ah, a rule. Um, double vision, can you say something about that? Yeah. Well, I uh, actually, my last grand rounds was a, a, a pretty significant amount on double vision. So sometimes, some things I didn't uh, repeat. Double vision, um, that can, you know, the things you don't want to miss, the guy that comes in with the one eye closed, you know, that's an emergency. The classic treatment or teaching in ophthalmology is that if they have something like that six nerve palsy and they're hypertensive or they're diabetic, it's probably from their hypertension or diabetes. So the classic treatment was you measure them, you see them back in a month, and if they're worse, you image. But I think these days um, patients expect us to image right away, and that's kind of what we do. So if it's intermittent and they've had it a long time, one of the common things is a, um, a congenital condition that just manifests itself. And so sometimes we need to use prism or you know, we need to see them. So emergent, the emergent thing is probably that cranial nerve three. That's the emergent one, if pupil's involved. But you know, there can also be non-pupil involved. We all know that there's exceptions to every rule in medicine. 
So I think a cranial nerve three should be sent right away. Cranial nerve six, you know, we're, we're happy to see them. We're nice people. Uh, but imaging probably makes all of us feel better because we already know if it's not that, then it's something that maybe isn't as emergent. For double vision, a lot of times when it's a patient in the hospital, I'll just take a, I'll just take a tissue. Boy, I'm so glad I brought my new glasses. I can show you this. Um, and I just actually put the tissue over their eye like this and then say, you know, you can switch it from back to back. So in the hospital, something like this can alleviate double vision. Because um, again, in the hospital, we're not going to be prescribing prism, that sort of thing. Did that help? Um, anybody else have any questions about you? Oh, okay, so wait in the microphone because we're recording this. Oh, the amps are grid. All right. So this is a formal AMSO grid. But as I said, you can, use, you can use your kid's fifth grade algebra paper, right? So what you're looking for, you're looking for wavy lines, OK? So if, the, if, the, if you've got macular edema, the line is going to bow. This particular AMSO grid has all these fancy instructions. And it says, cover one eye, because you always want to do one eye at a time. And look at the center of the dot and bring it towards you until the red dot disappears. And what that is, is that's actually where your optic nerve, that's your blind spot where your optic nerve exits the eye. And then you make sure that it's, um, it's perfectly straight. But I tell my patients, because half of them can't make the red dot disappear, that's really not the test. The test is look at it one eye at a time and make sure the lines are straight. Other questions? Well, seeing none, I will thank you very much for attending and encourage everyone to do the same. You know, present for grand rounds. I love grand rounds. I learn a lot. So thank you.